A new episode of The Mandalorian dropped yesterday with virtually zero fanfare. Seriously, I've seen nobody talking about this, just like with The Bad Batch Season 2, which also came out on the same day as The Mandalorian, or I guess I should say The Mandalorian is coming out on the same day as The Bad Batch, which is a weird choice for Disney. Has Disney given up on The Bad Batch? Are they trying to cover up how little interest that show has earned with the one popular Star Wars franchise? It's a strange decision to me that with Disney delaying the release of several Marvel projects that they wouldn't space out the current Star Wars content. You know, putting out a Star Wars thing in between each Marvel thing. On top of the lack of marketing for The Mandalorian, my own excitement level for it was pretty low after what they did to The Book of Boba Fett, which this episode seems to be ignoring, something I will talk about. That being said, I thought the episode was pretty good, but I can already see the potential for problems. And the key word is potential. I'm not saying it is going to be all bad after just one episode. So let's get into the first episode of Season 3 titled The Apostate, which, without the credits, is only about 30 minutes long. It starts off on an unnamed planet where the remainder of the Mandalorian sect, the Watch, are in the middle of initiating a young Mandalorian with a helmet that shamelessly looks like a piece of merchandise that Disney plans to sell to children if they aren't already. I mean, look how large the visor portion is compared to the other Mandalorians. A giant turtle alligator alien attacks the Mandalorians, and this scene seems to have been written for the explicit purpose of further demonstrating the camaraderie between the Mandalorians. It shows their teamwork and willingness to sacrifice themselves for each other, which isn't just a hallmark of their culture, but something that's become a necessity as a means of preserving that culture, given the low number of surviving Mandalorians after the Empire's purge. As a side note, what is with this scene and why does it keep appearing everywhere? Even though there are about 50 Mandalorians here, they can't take the beast out. But Din Djarin swoops in and kills the creature with his N1 Starfighter. Afterwards, Din Djarin speaks to the Armorer, who is the leader of this sect, and she tells him that he isn't a Mandalorian anymore because he took off his helmet, which happened in Season 2. He reminds her about a ritual where he would bathe in the living waters beneath the mines of Mandalore. Still, she tells him that it's impossible that the mines were destroyed in the Purge and the surface of the planet Mandalore has become poisonous. But wait a second. Didn't we already hear this exact conversation but reversed in the Book of Boba Fett? I'd understand if they wanted to reiterate the information to catch up fans who didn't watch Boba Fett, except this conversation negates that dialogue. The two characters are literally saying the opposite lines that they spoke before as if they hadn't had that conversation. Even though we know that the Mandalorian episodes in the Book of Boba Fett took place, most notably because Grogu is with Din Djarin again instead of with Luke Skywalker, which is where he was at the end of Mandalorian Season 2. Despite that knowledge, this interaction between Din Djarin and the Armorer makes it seem like that previous conversation never happened. That being said, Din Djarin does plan to go to Mandalore and prove that the planet isn't poisonous as well as redeem himself. Of course, the showrunners wouldn't land Din Djarin on Mandalore right off the bat. We likely won't see that until the end of the season. First, Mando stops at Navarro, where he hopes to revive and recruit IG-11, who self-destructed in Season 2 after saving Mando's life, because he needs a droid that he trusts to help him explore Mandalore's surface. Navarro has changed quite a bit since Season 1. It's gone from being a seedy desert hive of scum and villainy to a proper trading port led by High Magister Grief Karga, who uses his position to butter up Mando and convince him to be Navarro's marshal. You may be wondering, where is Cara Dune? That's the same question that Din Djarin asks. And Karga simply says that she was recruited by New Republic Special Forces. Now, if you've been paying attention to news about future Disney Plus Star Wars series, this would have been a reference to a new series called Rangers of the New Republic featuring a cast that would have been led by Gina Carano as Cara Dune. Of course, Gina Carano was fired by Disney because they wanted to distance themselves from stuff that she said on social media. I'm honestly not sure if that series is still even happening, and Disney hasn't stated whether or not they plan on recasting Cara Dune or not. I seriously doubt that they'd rehire Gina Carano. Whether you love her or hate her, you have to admit that, at this point, the controversy surrounding her makes her a bad investment for the future of Disney. I'm not going to go into all the specifics of Gina Carano's firing. There are hundreds of YouTube videos devoted to that subject. It's been done to death. But suppose you are just an average fan of The Mandalorian and you liked Cara Dune and aren't aware of the controversy around Gina Carano. 
In that case, you're probably looking at this explanation of her absence as wholly inadequate and completely out of nowhere, and I'd agree with you. Anyways, Manda takes the remaining pieces of IG-11, which had been turned into a statue for the town, and successfully reanimates him, only for IG-11 to revert to his original programming and try to kill Grogu, prompting Din Djarin to kill him again. And can I just say how weird it is that Din Djarin could easily revive IG-11? Remember back in the day when the child Anakin Skywalker was seen as a prodigy for his ability to understand machines and his piloting skills? Well, Mando proves that you can just be a random guy who can do anything as long as the plot demands it. After meeting members of the diminutive Anzellan race, which first appeared in canon in the film Rise of Skywalker in the, in the character Babu Frick, Mando is told that IG-11 can only be fixed if he gets a new memory drive. So now he has another quest before he can go to Mandalore. But even before that, he has another stop to make. On his way to the planet Kasavala in the Mandalore system, he is attacked by pirates led by Swamp Thing. Or rather, the pirate king named Gorian Shard. Din Djarin and Grief Karga had killed some of his pirates on Navarro, so he likely has a grudge against them. Mando and Grogu manage to escape, but I'm sure the pirates will come up again in the series. On the planet Kasavala, Din Djarin meets with Bo-Katan Kreese, who has completely given up on trying to retake Mandalore and likewise help Din Djarin, which is completely opposite of where she was the last time we saw her. Just a very strange 180. If you remember from the end of Season 2 or didn't watch it and decided to skip to this season for whatever reason, Din Djarin won the Darksaber from Moff Gideon. The Darksaber is pretty much the symbol of power in Mandalorian culture, an artifact meant to be held by the person who would unite all the Mandalorian factions. After she failed to retrieve it herself and not wanting to kill Din Djarin over it, bo forces left her alone to wallow in her castle while they scattered throughout the galaxy to take on mercenary work. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I would have much preferred a series about bo trying to reunite the Mandalorian factions and get revenge on the Empire, versus the story that we've gotten with Din Djarin. Sure, Din Djarin was cool in the first couple episodes of The Mandalorian, but I quickly became disinterested in his character. I just don't think he has an interesting personality. And I don't like this change they've made to Bo-Katan. It seems like a lazy way to possibly write her out of the series. There was an Easter egg that took place earlier in this episode where Grogu saw the Purgil, large whale-like creatures capable of traveling through hyperspace despite being fully organic beings. The Purgil were first introduced in the series Star Wars Rebels and played a large part in the finale of the series as the protagonist Ezra Bridger used the Purgil to defeat Imperial Admiral Thrawn by having the Purgil pull the Star Destroyer they were in into hyperspace where they got lost in wild space. We know from leaks and interviews that both Ezra Bridger and Admiral Thrawn will make their return in the Ahsoka series, and I think we'll see more story threads in The Mandalorian that lead up to it. I really enjoyed the pacing of this episode. I loved how they reintroduced us to the characters and the setting, with a couple exceptions, even though nothing too significant happened, the fast pace kept me engaged while not feeling like they just glossed over anything. This also leads me to my one worry for this season, which is that this episode was fast paced because it introduced several plot threads. You've got Din Djarin's main quest to earn redemption, which requires the side quest of fixing IG-11. You also have a number of background things going on. I'm sure that we'll return to Navarro where Grief Karga is looking for a new marshal. You've got the situation with the pirates and bo who, despite the change to her character, I'm not 100% sure that she'd sit out the entire season. My concern is that these varying story threads, no matter how small, could turn into entire filler episodes similar to The Bad Batch. But I'll hold off rendering judgment on the whole series until I've seen a few more episodes. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom about it, I am hoping that this is a good season. If you've seen the episode, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like and subscribe button and the notification bell so that you never miss out on a new video. Thanks for watching.